Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Farnworth, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General for British Columbia. I'm speaking with you today from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. In the summers of 2017 and 2018, BC faced the most damaging wildfire seasons in our history. While the fires we're seeing now are not yet as widespread, their impact has been great. The grief and hardship being faced by the people of Lytton and the Lytton First Nation is immense, and I offer my thanks for your partnership and all that you've done to support your communities. I also offer my condolences for the tragic loss of two of your own community members. I know the losses are fresh, and it will take time to process it all, but I am confident that we can work together to rebuild. The province will be there to support. The province will continue to do everything possible, as we have from the start, to protect communities from wildfires and support people who are required to evacuate from their homes. Since early July, Canadian Armed Forces assets have been providing airlift support to transport personnel, supplies and equipment into and out of areas affected by fires in British Columbia and aiding in evacuations. And just this morning, the federal government approved our request for additional personnel to support wildfire crews around the province, augmenting the federal resources already on the ground. This will involve mop-up work, extinguishing hotspots on contained fires, and monitoring operations. We've also deployed out-of-province crews and resources from Alberta, New Brunswick, Quebec, and Parks Canada. And this coming Saturday, approximately 100 firefighters from Mexico will arrive, accompanied by one COVID-19 safety officer and two agency representatives. Given the wildfire danger across Canada and the Pacific Northwest and the complications that come with COVID-19, it has been challenging to source trained crews. At this time, more than 3,180 firefighters and resource staff are currently actively engaged in fighting fires in all fire regions in the province. This includes 1,080 contractors and 135 out-of-province resources. I want to assure British Columbians that we are deploying all available personnel and equipment to fight the fires in communities across our province. Every opportunity is being pursued. In a briefing last night, officials advised that we will be facing some days of very difficult weather in the interior. What is forecast may lead to more severe fire behavior and the potential for more evacuations. As mentioned, resources remain tight, both on the fire lines and in our ability to provide accommodations to evacuees. Volunteer resources are also stretched thin. We have reached a critical point. Based on the advice of emergency management and wildfire officials and my briefing last night on the worsening weather, I am declaring a provincial state of emergency. This will address the potential for a mass evacuation scenario and provide our government with the means to secure the accommodation spaces necessary to support evacuees. Our government has seen incredible cooperation with the private sector and all levels of government, and I fully expect that to continue. But this measure will ensure that the province can do what is necessary moving forward. This provincial state of emergency will take effect at midnight tonight. It is my hope that extraordinary powers under the Emergency Program Act will not be necessary. But putting the declaration in place now gives us the ability to move quickly if that need arises. And that cooperation in this response will remain the priority of everyone. Wildfire threats to our communities are going to continue for the foreseeable future. Overnight, the Asoyas Indian Band was evacuated and alerts and orders were issued to parts of nearby Asuyus and Oliver. Alerts are also in place for 100 Mile House, Ashcroft, Clinton, and several other areas. We're still in mid-July with challenging conditions expected to persist in the coming weeks. So I wanna again ask anyone who may be threatened by wildfire this summer to get an evacuation plan ready. Contact friends and family to ensure you have somewhere to go should the worst happen. Heed the alerts and evacuation orders. 
While the province will continue to support anyone in need of emergency support services, having a plan will expedite care for those who have no other option. And if you have the opportunity and means, please do what you can to fire smart your property, whether that's trimming trees, clearing grass and gutters, and helping your neighbours. You're not only helping to protect your property and those in your community, but also the firefighters who may be called on to protect it. Again, I want to acknowledge and express sincere appreciation for the efforts of all involved in this emergency response. We will continue to assess and monitor the situation closely. Our government is committed to do whatever is necessary to protect and support local governments and First Nations. And we will see the other side of this fire season. We just need to work together for the best interest of anyone. Thank you for your time. Take care and stay safe. Thank you very much, Minister. We have four additional speakers on today's call. They are Cliff Chapman with the BC Wildfire Service, Peter Brock with Emergency Management BC, Eric Stubb with the BC RCMP, Dr. Sarah Henderson with the BC Centre for Disease Control. Media who wish to ask a question, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question only. We will offer follow-up once everyone has had a chance to ask their question. With that, I will now turn it over to Cliff Chapman with the BC Wildfire Service. Good afternoon and thank you for having me today. Uh, I want to echo Minister Farnsworth's comments, issuing a thank you to all BC Wildfire Service staff, contractors, partner agencies, and the communities who've been impacted by the, this uh, devastating wildfire season for their support and the support they've shown our people on the ground. Uh, it's truly appreciated from our staff who are working tirelessly around the clock trying to suppress these wildfires and knowing what's coming in, the, in this week, which I'll touch on in a little bit, I, we very much appreciate the, the shows of support from the communities and across the province. Uh, so a quick overview from BC Wildfire Service. So to date, we've had uh, 1,145 fires this wildfire season. Uh, we've had 11 new wildfires in the last 24 hours uh, and 145 wildfires in the last seven days. So significant increase in activity uh, from what would be norm, what would be deemed average in a 10-year average. Uh, to date, we have there is a total of 300,000 hectares that have burned within the province of BC. That's approximately 200,000 hectares more than the 10-year average for this time of year within the province of BC. Uh, Minister Farnsworth touched on the resources that we've deployed across the province, uh, including multiple out-of-province and out-of-country resources which are uh, arriving this week into the province. Uh, with the rundown that Minister Farnsworth gave, we are expecting roughly 500 additional staff uh, joining the support efforts and the suppression efforts on the ground uh, in the next 10 days, which is going to be welcome help for our staff and our crews on the, in the field. The forecast that, that Minister Farnsworth touched on, uh, we are expecting what we call a subtropical feed uh, coming up from the United States, which is going to bring significant wind into the sub Southeast Fire Center and the interior of the province. What this means is that we are going to see our, our efforts on the fires that are on the landscape challenged. Our control lines will be challenged and we're, we have the potential to see significant fire behavior across the province, in particular in the southern half of the province where the conditions remain extremely dry and extremely volatile. Uh, there is a wind warning that went out today which covers the next 48 hours and we are doing everything we can to prepare for the incoming wind event very likely not to see any moisture come with the event uh, over the next two days and we're doing everything we can to prepare for the existing fires as well as the potential that we may see another uh, batch of lightning come through the southeast and potentially the campus fire centers which will lead to additional starts within the land base while we continue to try to suppress the fires that already exist. Uh, with that, the final message from BC Wildfire Service is, uh, and Minister Farnsworth touched on it, please have an evacuation plan ready for your family. Uh, yesterday on one of our incidents, we had folks that remained within an evacuation order zone. We deployed aircraft assets who put their lives at risk to try to evacuate those people. Uh, at night, smoky conditions and extreme fire behavior. I can tell you from working in this branch for 20 years that I would, I would be taking my family out if I was on an evacuation order today. And I encourage everyone in BC to take that advice and do the same for your family. 
And with that, uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you. Now we turn to Peter Brock with Emergency Management BC. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll just expand and reinforce Cliff's points he made on behalf of BC Wildfire. So just, I want to be really clear, when you are in evacuation order, you are at risk, um, as, as mentioned previously. And when, when you are in evacuation order, leave the area immediately. For evacuation alert, you, if you're on evacuation alert, be prepared to leave your home quickly. And our team at EMBC is asking those on evacuation alert uh, to monitor your local authority public information channels um, for both alerts or orders. And it's very fluid and changes very quickly. Uh, so be sure to monitor your local authority, and that is the source uh, of information. Uh, create an emergency kit and a grab-and-go bag uh, for yourself or your family. Make sure that you have clothing, medications, water, food, comfort items, and important documents and things like photo albums, photo albums or other things that can't be replaced. Please, as mentioned, uh, as the minister had previously mentioned, please plan your accommodation with family members or friends, and this will really help British Columbians with acquiring accommodations where they don't have those options and it frees up space in hotels and other areas uh, where, where there are people that are having a hard time finding places to stay. Um, if, if you are evacuated, make sure you register with emergency support services and that's whether or not you need support. It's just so that your loved ones and communities know where you, where you are and where, when you're safe. You can register online at ess.gov.bc.ca or by phone at 1-800-585-9559. And if you need support, please proceed to one of your local reception centers so they can help you. Uh, that's all I have for my update today. Uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eric Stubb with BC RCMP. Hi, good afternoon. A quick update from the BC RCMP. Uh, we are continuing uh, to assist numerous communities uh, across the province with this wildfire event. Obviously, it's very dynamic and changes uh, at quick notice. Um, we are continuing to identify and deploy RCMP resources in those areas that are subject to evacuation alerts or, or orders. We have uh, to date already deployed uh, 100 RCMP officers and support staff to specific areas uh, around the province. Uh, in addition to that, we do have uh, some uh, officers on standby ready to deploy if needed uh, if a new fire uh, does break out. I do want to note um, uh, an important point. Uh, any areas that are subjected to an evacuation order, um, we are there. We, we, uh, if we can and it's safe, we're still in the area. We have roving patrols uh, to monitor these areas to prevent looting or any thefts, as well as uh, our roadblocks that, uh, and checkpoints that we have established. In regards to uh, specific communities, obviously uh, the fire in the Soyuz and Oliver yesterday uh, was a dynamic one. We did a number of tactical evacuations, worked very closely um, with the Soyuz Indian Band as well as the local search and rescue group. It went very well. Um, some communities in the interior, 100 Mile House, Clinton, Ashcroft, um, they, there is a threat of an evacuation order uh, potentially looming, so we, we have uh, proactively deployed more resources in that area in case that occurs, so a safe uh, evacuation of those communities, if needed, uh, can occur. I also want to, as others have done, Minister Farnworth and others, I want to emphasize um, um, every, every community that is under an alert or order to be ready to have a plan. We certainly um, are, are really pleased to see when we do door-to-door -door tactical evacuations, when people are ready to go, they're packed and they go. Um, that is uh, something we'd like to see and uh, we don't always see that. So please, uh, when you're in this situation, you need to be ready. Uh, thank you very much. And again, uh, please take any questions if, uh, if needed. Thank you very much. And our final speaker today is Dr. Sarah Henderson with the BC Centre for Disease Control. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me. I want to reiterate the thanks for our first responders who are working under very difficult circumstances out there. I just want to give you an update on the wildfire smoke situation. We do have significant smoke throughout the central and eastern part of the province. The atmosphere is quite well mixed right now, so that smoke is moving up. But we also have significant smoke starting to come in from fires in the U.S. as well. And with the conditions that are predicted over the next few days, we may see even more wildfire smoke in the area. 
wildfire smoke can certainly affect the health of everybody. We all need to breathe. Uh, it is particularly concerning for those who have pre-existing respiratory conditions, such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. If you are not under evacuation alert or order, we recommend that you take uh, precautions if you feel that you are suffering from the smoke by creating a cleaner airspace in your home if possible. If you are under alert, uh, evacuation alert or order, please be sure if you use rescue medications to like, ensure that you have an ample supply with you and to work with your physicians and pharmacists to ensure that you can keep those rescue medications with you and that you have a plan for bringing any exacerbations under control that you have. Smoke just makes everything, all of this more difficult. Also very happy to answer any questions about smoke and health. Thank you very much. That concludes our operational updates today. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will initially be limited to one question. Once you've concluded your question, please feel free to press star one and enter the queue for a follow-up. Our first question today goes to Richard Buckman, Global News. Uh, Minister Farnworth, what took so long for us to call the state of emergency, especially considering we have heard over the last few days that all the evacuation spaces in terms of hotels were full in Kamloops, were full in a number of other communities. Uh, did you take too long to do this? And, and what do you say about getting people into places now as more people are being evacuated and there are fears that even more will be evacuated? Uh, thanks for the question, Richard. Uh, decision to go to a state of emergency, as I've uh, uh, indicated in, uh, in previous uh, uh, interviews, has been based on advice that I receive from the experts at uh, BC, Wildlife, uh, BC Wildfire Service uh, and EMBC. Uh, based on the briefing that I had last night about the, uh, the, the, the weather events that we're facing and the potential for significant uh, winds and uh, dry lightning and the, and the potential for, for uh, extremely aggressive fires as a result of that, uh, the decision was made to uh, in, in put in place the, uh, the, the state of uh, provincial emergency. Uh, that's monitored on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, we currently have 13 evacuation centers in place. While yes, there are um, full in uh, Kamloops or very tight in Kamloops, there are lots of spaces uh, in other parts of the province, for example, in Prince George. Uh, and I can tell you that, for example, last week uh, at the centre there, there were about 130 evacuees there. But we recognise that uh, there needs to be a significant uh, number of, uh, of, of centres possible. And this is one of those areas that if we do have to have a significant evacuation taking place, because uh, if there are, are, are fires uh, that, that occur that cause that, then we're going to, to we want to make sure that those spaces are there. Uh, this uh, uh, state of provincial emergency will, in fact, uh, ensure that takes place. Uh, the reality is this. We've had amazing cooperation from local governments uh, already in identifying spaces, uh, but we want to make absolutely sure, and I fully expect that will continue, we want to make absolutely sure that uh, we have the, uh, the ability to house evacuees uh, if there is a significant evacuation that, that's going to uh, have to take place. Next question, Victor Kaiser, Radio and L. Minister, uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, Richard kind of asked part of my question, so I guess I'll ask you on this front. Uh, what would you say to a lot of people in the interior who, uh, in the Kamloops area, you know, we've been with smoky, uh, fiery conditions now for weeks, and yes, the situation in the Soyuz Oliver was significant, uh, but they seem to feel that because now it impacts people in the lower mainland that may have cottages and what have you in that part of the province, uh, you're now acting based on the information that you received. So what do you tell to a lot of these people who feel like they've just been ignored now for the past several weeks uh, up until this point? I fully understand that uh, smoke-filled skies uh, are incredibly frustrating and fire is incredibly frustrating. We all do. Uh, but the idea that somehow it's because uh, people live in the lower mainland aren't impacted is just simply not correct. We have uh, right now over 3,000 men and women uh, fighting fires in this province. Uh, we have had great support from the, uh, the federal government uh, in terms of uh, making uh, not only aircraft uh, available, but uh, ground resources available as well. Uh, we have had amazing cooperation with uh, local governments right across the province, and in particular uh, in the Caribou, in the Caribou region. Uh, everything that we can possibly do in terms of securing resources is being done. 
uh, and that's been in place since this, uh, this fire season started and it started early. Uh, and we are going to continue to ensure that the supports are there for people both in terms of uh, social services for those who are evacuated and to ensure that we have as many resources as possible uh, on, those, on those front lines fighting fires. And as I said, there's over 3,000 um, men and women, um, mostly British Columbians, but a lot from uh, outside of this province, uh, and on Saturday are going to be joined by uh, more than 100 uh, firefighters coming up from Mexico. Next question is Lisa Yusta, News 1130. Hi, Minister. You know, this area is one area, you know, when you're talking about the southeast corner, is an area that's, that we're still looking forward to tourism once getting out of the pandemic. How are you going to ensure that the message of safety for people who are living in the area gets out, as well as messages for people who want to come visit of where it's safe, where it's not, so people just don't blanket stay away and think that the, you know, the whole southern part of the province is on fire. How do you walk that line and how will you walk that line? I think one of the, one of the things I would say to that is uh, that's why it's important to follow the, uh, the wildfire updates uh, that are available uh, daily and are, are online. Uh, and you can see where the evacuation alerts uh, and orders are. But it's also to use, uh, to use common sense and to, uh, to check ahead. Uh, that's also one of the, the, the powers uh, under the state of emergency, for example, uh, that I would have available, which is uh, that if, for example, there was a significant evacua evacuation having to take place, then there would be the ability to, uh, to put in place a travel restriction. And obviously, that would be, uh, that would be well, well publicized. For the next question, we go to Wayne Moore, Captain S. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, just curious, in terms of um, the timber lost and, and money spent, I'm wondering if you can um, give us an idea uh, of this fire season in terms of what we've seen in other historic seasons uh, from 2003 and also 2017 and 2018. Okay. Uh, in terms of money spent, what I'll say at this point is that uh, we spend what's required to fight the fires. Um, you know, that's, uh, budget is not, is not an issue. Uh, and so, so in terms of the money spent, we will have a better understanding towards later in the, in the fire season. Right now, the priority is fighting those fires. Uh, in terms of, of timber lost, um, what I'll do is I'll turn that question over to, uh, to, uh, to BC Wildfire to see if they have an idea. But I, I, if they don't, then we can probably get, get some indication from, uh, from uh, uh, the Ministry of Forests. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I don't have the specifics on the numbers, but it, it, in terms of comparing this fire season to 2017 or 2018, I have said on past media briefs in, prior to this that it, it wasn't the right time to compare it, and I would I would say that again. We, we can do the comparisons at the end of the season. As I said in my intro today, we're roughly 300,000 hectares burnt to date. It's only July 20, 20th today. We have a long season ahead of us. And in 17 and 18, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was roughly half a million hectares in each of those seasons. So we are, we are certainly trending towards having a similar season to 2017 or 2018. And that's something that, you know, why, as Minister Farnsworth said, budget is something that, you know, we're throwing all resources available, not just within BC, but internationally, to do everything we can to suppress these wildfires, both to protect communities and obviously also to protect resource values on the land base. Our next question is from Ben Milter, CTV. Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Um now that you have uh, declared this state of emergency effective in this, what resources does that unlock for the province that were not available yesterday? Um, what it does is gives uh, uh, myself as minister the, the power, for example, to, uh, to, to ensure that we have enough evacuation spaces if a major evacuation uh, is required. Um, does it uh, unlock additional uh, firefighting resources in terms of boots on the ground? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, that is coordinated through the interagency uh, fire center in Winnipeg. Uh, and that's already in place, and they have been supplying uh, firefighters from out of province to us already. Uh, in terms of our agreements, uh, partnerships with uh, firefighters from outside of the province, again, they're already, they're already in, uh, in place. 
Uh, in terms of the private sector, um, it would allow me, for example, to technically commandeer uh, an aircraft or trucks if that were required. Uh, but the reality is this, is the private sector has stepped up and has provided resources that we've requested and, and that, uh, that, uh, we have, uh, that we have needed. Our next question goes to Jeff Andreas, Radio NL. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I guess this is for Emergency Management BC, but we've been hearing from local mayors, from regional districts for a couple of weeks asking for a state of emergency to be called, and there has been a reluctancy to call one until this point. I know Minister Farworth, yourself, and, and Premier John Horgan have said numerous times, a state of emergency not going to have a significant impact, and you just sort of went over that again on, on what powers it actually changes for yourself. Uh, but for Emergency Management BC, you know, what's changed over the last two weeks? Uh, you know, we've been waiting for this call to be made, and finally the advice was given yesterday. Why did it take this long? That question uh, I already answered, and that is, as minister, I am the minister responsible for authorizing a state of emergency. Uh, each day I get an update, and uh, I am, uh, w the, the situation is constantly monitored. Uh, and I can tell you, based on the, on the briefing that I received last night about the, uh, the change in weather and the significant potential uh, with high winds and dry lightning for uh, uh, not only additional fires, but uh, to accelerate aggressive fire behavior, that's the decision uh, that, uh, that uh, w was taken at that point uh, to uh, go, we are going to declare a, a, state, of, uh, a state of emergency. Uh, that's how those decisions are made. That's no different than in 2017 and 2018. For our next question, we go to Amy Smart, Canadian Press. Hi there. Over the weekend, EMBC issued a statement um, kind of having to do with the, the tight accommodations and encouraging people who have self-evacuated to consider returning home. Um, I'm wondering, given the forecast and the fact that many communities have had to leave so quickly that they don't have notice, they can't grab their shoes, they can't grab whatever. Um, is that advice changing now that there's a state of an emergency? No, the advice, uh, the advice around evacuation orders and evacuation alerts uh, continues uh, to remain in place. Uh, and that's why uh, we encourage everyone to, uh, to have uh, an evacuation plan at the ready and also to abide by the evacuation alerts and the evacuation orders. Uh, what we want to do is to ensure that we are in the, in the case of, a, of an evacuation, uh, that there are places for people to go. That's why there are 13 uh, evacuation centers right now. Uh, we know that in some of those places that they are, they are tight in terms of accommodations, but there are spaces in, in, in other communities and we're also working to ensure that we have those spaces. Uh, what the state of emergency will do, uh, as I said, is allow us to ensure that that's in place by, by if necessary, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to say this is where an evacuation center will be, whether it be a, a private facility or, or a public facility, for example. Uh, the other thing to remember, too, is that when Emergency BC encourages people uh, to, you know, if they're able to return home, that's because that evacuation order has been lifted or that, um, uh, or the evacuation alert has also been downgraded. So it's always done on the basis of safety uh, for, for, the, uh, for the public uh, and the, uh, the individuals affected by those states of alerts and states of orders. I'd like to invite members of the media who would like to ask a follow-up question to please press star one to enter the queue. For the first follow-up, we go to Richard Zussman, Global News. Now, historically, Minister, when the province has declared a state of emergency, it has a, had a profound impact on the tourism sector, uh, especially uh, in the capital region and Metro Vancouver. We know the tourism sector has been battered by the pandemic. Are you concerned that the declaration of the state of emergency will have a continued impact on those tourism sectors? I don't... Uh... I don't believe it will have an impact in the sense that what people are going to do and what I, what I know most people will do is they are going to check and see what's happening uh, in, in the area of the province that they want to go. And so if they know that there is, uh, you know, uh, a, a travel restriction or if they know that there is an evacuation order for a particular community or an evacuation alert, uh, they're, not likely, uh, they're not likely to go. They'll look at somewhere else to go. I can tell you just for example, uh, my brother was looking to go uh, up, to, uh, up to his, uh, his cabin uh, near Sheridan Lake. Uh, it's under an evacuation alert. Um, obviously, um, you know, 
is not going to go up there. Um, but people need to, to pay attention because, as we know, this is a fluid situation. Um, fires uh, start, but fires also get put out. And areas that were under an alert or, an, or under, under an evacuation alert or an evacuation order, um, that, uh, that, gets, uh, that gets downgraded or, or, or is, uh, you know, is no longer required. So I think most people are going to look and see, uh, see what's going on in the area that they want to visit. Next to Lisa Yusa, News 1130. Just to follow up on Richard's question there, will there be any messaging, I mean, you've been clear with the messaging specific to people who are in dangerous situations and in dangerous areas and with closures, but beyond that emergency measure, is there going to be anything specific to tourists coming, knowing that the industry has been so battered and is trying so hard to get back on their feet? And we've heard from many that there are concerns with the state of emergency with people not knowing the geography of BC, We'll presume that because Oliver, you know, is devastated, that other areas that are far away are as well. And so is there going to be any measures taken to counteract the message and the fear that will come with the state of emergency for people, especially not from the province? We will obviously be working with the tourism industry and tourism associations uh, to ensure that we are able to get uh, the message out that, uh, that many parts of British Columbia are available um, you know, to, to, to travel and to ensure that there is a uh, good uh, communication and messaging in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the fire situation uh, in the different parts of the province. Uh, but I think all of us also recognize too that, uh, that public safety uh, uh, is absolutely uh, a paramount. Uh, and whether you're a resident or, or a tourist, uh, you expect that. But absolutely, we will be working with the, uh, the tourism associations and the tourism industry. Next question, Ben Milger, CTV. Uh, yeah, Minister Farnworth, uh, any time that we have evacuation orders, uh, there are only some people who don't comply uh, and choose to stay behind, whether to defend their properties or, or for whatever reason they might, they might have. What is your message to people uh, about how that impacts resources and puts people at risk if they don't follow those evacuation orders? When you don't follow an evacuation order, you're not only putting yourself uh, and potentially loved ones at risk, you're also putting at risk the lives of those who may have to come and evacuate you uh, from an area because you decided that, that uh, you, you were going to ignore the, uh, the evacuation order. And that just, uh, that's just not acceptable. Um, you know, we've got men and women who are out there doing everything they can to keep uh, life safe, to protect property, and the last thing that we need is re resources being diverted uh, because someone decided that they knew better and that they were going to ignore an evacuation order. Our next question goes to Jeff Andreas, Radio NL. Hi, thanks. Um, I guess I was hoping to get Peter Brock to respond to this, but um, you know, I, I understand the forecast has changed and more winds are anticipated and that's why this uh, state of emergency is being declared. So I guess for Peter, are you anticipating, you know, thousands of new evacuations to be um, necessary in the next couple of days and that's why your advice changed as of last night? It's depended, it depends on the, the situation of what happens in fires in terms of how evacuations have to take place. Uh, what we're concerned about is uh, wind events, uh, dry lightning, uh, and what was uh, 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 acknowledged in terms of this uh, subtropical uh, event moving, moving northwards. Uh, that's, uh, that's, what drives, that's what drives lightning, uh, that's what drives winds, and that's subsequently uh, what drives, drives fires. And so if you have uh, uh, lightning strikes uh, and fires developing near communities, uh, that may well uh, result in, in significant evacuations. We've seen it in the past, and we want to make sure that we are prepared for it. And that's why, uh, based on the advice last night, that the uh, state of emergency is being put in place. And our last question goes to Victor Kaiser, Radio NL. Hi again, Minister. Um, just kind of adding on what Jeff just asked you, uh, you know, we've seen pretty similar forecasts in the Kamloops area and parts of the Caribou as well, you know, hot, dry, some lightning, not a lot of rain. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on exactly what some of that advice is that you would have got that prompts us to, to take us to where we are right now, because uh, to a lot of us here, like I said, in the interior, it's been hot, dry, and smoky for, for weeks now. So I'm wondering what's, what's the difference now? 
Well, there's already a, a base of significant fires underway, uh, and when you receive advice that, uh, guess what, uh, it's now going to get even potentially worse than what it is, uh, and that will potentially result in a, uh, the, the need for uh, uh, even more evacuations, and potentially significant evacuations, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's also uh, uh, pretty sobering. Uh, we know that, uh, that uh, what you've been dealing with in Kamloops for the last uh, 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 several weeks uh, and the, uh, the men and women out, out fighting uh, the, the fires as, as, as hard as they can, but uh, when we receive advice that uh, it's going to get uh, even worse based on what we're, what we're, what we're seeing, um, the appropriate decision uh, was to listen to that advice and uh, put in place the, uh, the state of emergency which we've done today. And that's how it is done in this province and that's how it's been done in the past, whether it was 2017 or 2018 uh, and now uh, 2021. Okay, and I believe we have a last minute joiner. Uh, are we able to go to Martello Bernardo who's 11.30? Hello? Oh, go ahead, go ahead please, Martello. Thank you. Hi. So I just wanted to ask about concerns being raised about resources being uh, brought in from Australia and other countries where COVID may be a factor. Um, we heard that 500 personnel are coming in. Can you elaborate on where they're coming from and what kind of problems have you encountered just trying to get crews to come here from other provinces and other regions that might be able to put more boots on the ground? Um, well, I can tell you in terms of uh, other provinces, there are protocols in place. Uh, there's the interagency center in, uh, in Winnipeg, which coordinates uh, the deployment of resources, uh, and we work very closely with them uh, and uh, other provinces, and in particular uh, New Brunswick uh, and Ontario and, and Quebec at the present time. So, so that is, that's already been in place, and it's been in place for quite some time. Uh, in terms of the firefighters coming in from Mexico, again, um, uh, COVID-19 protocols are in place, and they are coming in on Saturday, uh, and they will be going straight to uh, the hot zones uh, where they're needed uh, in teams of uh, five teams of 20. Uh, in terms of resources uh, from Australia, I can tell you that we have been in touch with, uh, with Australia. Uh, they have uh, particular COVID uh, uh, issues uh, uh, themselves at the, at the moment, uh, and we are working with them, uh, but there's not been at this point a commitment to have uh, firefighters uh, come here uh, from, uh, from Australia. Marcella, do you have a follow-up? No, nope, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. That concludes today's information update. Our next scheduled update is Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. Thank you and have a great day.